in Psalm chapter 143 today, or 143, however you want to, however you want to say it. Uh, turn there now in your Bibles as you go there. While you're turning, it's so funny the things that pop into your head. Um, like if you're trying to worship and just focus on the Lord, and it's so funny the thing that popped in my head. I was getting a little distracted, and I could just hear my son. I got like a two-year-old son. His name's Judah, and. Uh, he has discovered this superpower. And the superpower is he wakes up in the morning and realizes, wait, I can open my bedroom door and just leave. And so what I've woken up to the past week since he's discovered his newfound superpower is uh, I've woken up to him in various places of the houses of, of the house. Uh, we have a baby gate at the bottom of the stairs, but one morning I woke up and I just hear him giggling at my bedroom door. <laughs> and I'm like, Judah? And he's like, <laughs> And he like, I opened the door and he's like curled up in fetal position looking at me like, ah, I'm not supposed to be here. And he's not. Uh, or the, <laughs> my personal favorite was two days ago, he was in his sister's room and I heard her monitor going off. Uh, she's like one year old and he is in her room and he is tickling her feet while she's sleeping. So my da poor daughter is trying to sleep and she's like, ah, like laughing. And my son's like hiding by the side of the bed, tickling her feet. So I don't know like where you learn that as a kid. Like I didn't instruct him to do that, but I don't know if it's sinful nature. I don't know if it's brilliance. I, I don't know. Like, is it wrong as a parent to look at your kid and be like, is this like a super villain origin story right now? Like, am I watching like a, or am I watching a genius? I can't tell you're brilliant and also running into things with your skull. It's hard to, hard to, being a parent's awesome. Just throwing it out there, so. All right, that's my sermon. So, no, I'm kidding. Uh, we're in Psalm 143 uh, today. So we're gonna be going through uh, a psalm in the book of Psalms. Uh, and we're gonna be going through one written by David. Uh, and it is one of the Psalms of Confession, as some refer to it. Um, there are seven Psalms of Confession where David is expressing uh, remorse or uh, expressing his need for mercy from God. Uh, and this is the final one in the book of Psalms uh, regarding that. And, and as you read Psalms, I'm a pretty emotional person, a feeler. And so I like the book of Psalms because there's a lot of emotion in it. There's a lot of feeling in it. Uh, if you're a person who's not much of a feeler, you probably like the book of Proverbs more because it's like, give me the facts, give me the details, give me the wisdom. Uh, and I like, I personally like how Psalms or Proverbs reads like almost like a fortune cookie. Uh, and it feels like Psalms more reads like a song because it is a song. Uh, and so David writes this one and we're gonna, we're gonna get into it. And I, I really like the title of this one. Uh, it's entitled, at least in some translations, An Earnest Appeal for Guidance and Deliverance. An Earnest Appeal for Guidance and Deliverance. So David is in a challenging place in his life. We don't know exactly which, but there are many challenges in his life this could be referring to. Uh, and so I'm gonna read the first few verses, pray, and then we will get into our study today says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment of your servant, for in your sight no one is living, no one is living that is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to, death, to the ground, and he has made me dwell in darkness. Like those who long to be dead, therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me and my heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old, and I meditate on all of your works. I muse on the works of your hands, and I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for if for in you I do trust. Cause me to know the way which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Uh, would you pray with me? Father God, just that last line, we do just this evening pray that we would lift up our souls to you. Be it in worship, be it in the reading of your word, be it in the drive home and what our thoughts are dwelling upon, be it in the way we interact with people. I, I just pray that we lift up our soul to you. We lift up our lives to you and say, God, how do you want to direct me? How do you want to guide me? 
What is it you want me to do? I pray, Lord, that we would be able to sift through our emotions and we would be able to discern what it is that, that you are teaching us through this Psalm of David. We love you, God. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Um, pitch is an incredibly important thing when you are hearing someone call out to you. Um, you can hear someone's tone of their voice or the pitch, and they could be very sarcastic uh, when they're calling out. Someone could call out in almost like a joyful way. And the same word can carry a lot of different meaning the way it is said. For example, the word help. You could call out like almost laughingly like, oh, help, like, you know, like you're, you're calling out for help because, I don't know, you're in a tickle fight and you're losing, okay? And you're calling out like, oh, help, please. Uh, and it's, you know, a way to call out. I just had flashbacks of being a kid and being tickled to death, but that's just me. Uh, or you can call out for help in, in serious distress. Please help. And there's a, there's a seriousness to hearing that call. There can be a sarcastic tone to it. There's, there's so many different ways the same word can be spoken and have different inflection. And I think it's interesting as you hear David's call to the Lord, there is an urgency. There is a desperation. There is a, a, a true appeal to God saying, I need help, and it is immediate. And the terminology and the wording of it is, is fierce. And just focusing on verse 1 and 2, you start off and you hear him say, Look, Lord, I have a prayer. Please hear my prayer. Give attention to what I have to say. Please hear what I have to say. And then he says this interesting phrase. He says, In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no one that is living is found righteous. I find this interesting because David is appealing to God, not saying, hey God, please help me because you owe me one. Please help me because I've been really good. Please help me because I'm deserving of your help based on my actions or my words or my deeds or my obedience. Actually, he is saying something very contrary. He's saying, God, I recognize that I am not worthy to be helped right now. I don't deserve it. I recognize that my actions are actually deserving of punishment and that I am not righteous before you. So instead, he is appealing to something different. He is saying, God, based on your nature, based on your love, based on your forgiving self, I ask you, please help me. Help me. Help me because of who you are. If you're going to ask somebody for a favor, Let's say there's some favors that you, you never want to ask anyone because they're, they're just such horrible things to ask. For example, you got to go to a flight at an airport and you got to find somebody to drop you off at the airport. That's like a best friend move, okay? You don't just drive casually random people to the airport to drop them off for their flight and then pick them up. Or you got a big piano you got to move and you got to call some people for that or you're moving in general. I feel really bad for guys that have pickup trucks because all your friends call you and they're like, hey, what's going on? You're great. So you got a pickup truck, right? And you know where this is going. Like, you know where this is going, okay? So I got this piano or I got this mattress I need moved and you're like, all right, here we go. And, and, and there's this way in which you can ask though. You can ask some people and be like, hey, remember when I helped you move? So now, you know, I need to move and I need your help. Or, hey, remember, remember when you needed that money to lend you and now I need some money and can you lend? And there's this idea of, hey, I helped you. I was there for you. So because of what I have done now, I'm kind of asking for a favor back. And then there are other people where you ask them and you know their character and you know their nature. And you've seen them give in the past. And you've seen the way that they love other people. And you're not afraid to ask them. You don't feel like you have to come to them and say, hey, you know, I'm going to kind of force you into it or see if you're free and then ask you. It's a, no, no, no. I'm going to ask freely because I know you're the kind of person who just wants to help, who is forgiving. It's actually telling. Um, I work with middle school students and it's actually telling to me the, the kids that feel comfortable going to their parents when they make a mistake it says something about what their parents are like. It says something about the nature of a parent. When a kid messes up and they go, oh no, I can't let my mom or dad know. But if you flip that and they say, oh no, I messed up, I gotta let mom and dad know. 
There's this understanding that I, I can trust my mom and dad and that they're for me and they love me and they, they will actually help me in this situation, not just beat me over the head when I do something wrong. There's this trust that is developed there. And David is saying, look, God, I got actually nothing that, that you owe me. In fact, I actually owe you a debt of my own sin. I am deserving of punishment. But, but I know your nature. And I know your heart as a father. And out of your love for me, will you please forgive me? And will you please help me, though I don't deserve it? David continues in verse 3. And he says, For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. And he has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long long been dead. Therefore, my soul is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is depressed, or sorry, is distressed. Um, you read that, and it's just heavy wording. It's just heavy. It's kind of like um, if you got a Spotify uh, liked list. I have a Spotify like liked songs, and I'll go on there, and it has like all of these emotions at the top, and you can pick a playlist based on what you're feeling. Okay, so if you're feeling happy, you pick happy, and it picks all the songs from your playlist that are happy. Or you know, uh, I my favorite one recently was angst. If you're feeling angst, and it's like all of these like teenage grunge bands from back when I was in middle school. You know what I mean? It was wonderful, uh, but also you had to be in the mood for it. And usually when we go to art, we go to art saying, what am I feeling? And then I want to experience that. So, you know, you go to music, and you're like, what am I feeling right now? And, and, And you read this and you can hear the heaviness. I mean, if this was a playlist on Spotify, it would just be anguish, despair, brokenness. And not over some middle school relationship ending. Like, it's something bigger than that. It, it is, my soul is currently feeling crushed. Listen, listen to some of this wording. I feel a persecution of my soul. I am crushed. My life is crushed to the ground. I am dwelling in darkness. I am overwhelmed. I'm distressed. And you read this, and there is a powerful emotional charge to the words of David. I am hurting. I am struggling. I am in a challenging place. And this is an important first step to getting any kind of resolution. Um, Maybe I'm a guy, and I just picture guys struggling with this most, but guys struggle to ask for help a lot. Um, we, we, we don't like, you know, the stereotypical one is, oh, guys don't like to ask for directions. You know, we don't, we don't like to admit when we're wrong. Or we don't like to confess that there's a problem. Uh, and I see this play out all kinds of ways. Um, I saw my son, he was at a, uh, we were at like a, um, a kid's play place and they had like a moon bounce and he couldn't jump over the lip to get onto the moon bounce. And so he kept trying and I'm like, dude, I'll give you a boost. And he's like, no, no. And he just wanted to jump up there. And for a good 20 minutes, he'd get like a running start and run into the moon bounce. I don't know why he couldn't figure out that he should jump, but he just ran into it and fell over and he'd cry and then he'd get up and try again. And I'm like, I'm going to let this play out. I'm just going to see what happens. And so for 20 good minutes, the kid couldn't get on the moon bounce and was crying. And then finally, this like four or five year old girl hops on ahead of him. She's going on the moon bounce and she turns around and she sees him and, and he's like crying and she just simply does this, like holding her hand out. And I'm like, that is adorable. Here my son is learning to ask for help and, and then he slaps her hand out of the way. I'm like, son, what are you doing? Like that could have been like your origin story for meeting your wife and you're like, no. And so she's like, oh yeah, whatever. And she runs inside. So again, for 21 minutes, my son just runs into the thing like a doofus. But you know, I, 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 it's so funny when you look at your children and you see things and you're like, how could you not know better? And yet so many times I look at them and I see myself and I'm like how do I not know better how do I not know when to admit yeah I think I'm I think I'm struggling with some depression here I think I'm struggling with a temptation I can't conquer I think I'm struggling with a relationship I I, I'm not properly handling and we don't easily like to admit that but the first step in reconciliation or solving a problem I should say is admitting that there is a problem If you go to any kind of uh, addiction seminar and they have their step-by-step program, the first step in getting sober or getting clean is always admitting that you have the problem. You must confess to yourself and other people, I am addicted. I am beaten. I cannot beat this on my own. I need help. 
And sometimes people have to tell you that for you. Maybe have an intervention like, hey, this has got a hold of you and you can't stop this. And so David here has reached that place of saying, I need help. And I recognize that the help is not me. I am not the solution. I am not the the problem fixer in this situation. I need some help. And we don't know what the enemy was. We don't know if it was Saul chasing him. We don't know if it was Absalom, one of his sons who rebelled against him. We don't know if it was the Philistines. We we don't know the situation, but, but we know the heart posture. And we know where he was at. And he was at the end. And for this moment, I, I just, I want you to consider for just a moment, like, what, what is that thing for you that you struggle with that you're like, man, this, this is something that is bigger than me. Like, if I admit it, it's bigger than me. And we like to say things like, no, 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 like, you don't get it. Like, you know, I can beat Satan any day. Like, he's got nothing on me. No, that's not true. Actually, you in and of yourself are no match for Satan. There's like millennia of human history to prove that, okay? We are sinful, we are broken, we mess up all the time, and Satan knows just the right emotions to play or just the right things to put in your life to derail you and to beat you. And unless you can confess that you're at a position where you have a problem, you cannot fix it on your own, it's not going to get fixed. And I... I, I think it's worth mentioning, I think it's worth mentioning in this position um, that, how do I word this? I'm a person who's pretty diligent in wanting to fix a problem when I find one. I like YouTube, I like typing in my problems and finding somebody who walks me through a step-by-step process. Here's how to unclog your drain. Here's how to change the brakes on your car. Here is how to, I don't know, dress better or fold a pocket square or whatever. Like if you look at my YouTube search history, it's usually like, I don't know how to do this. Can you please help me? And I, 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 I love on Instagram, if I'm watching reels, they're all reels where it's like, you got this, do better, grind harder. You know, there's this like, gr- there's this like, I love, I think entrepreneur uh, TikTok or Instagram is hysterical, where it's like, wake up 5 a.m. Psych, wake up 4 a.m., okay? Take a cold shower, okay? Journal all day. Then work out for four hours and then go to work an hour early just to show you want it more. And there's this idea of like grind harder, and especially in America where we're like, just work harder than everybody else. And don't get me wrong, Nothing wrong with structure, nothing wrong with taking problems on, nothing wrong with any of that until you encounter something that is outside of your control and you try to control it and you try to beat it and you try to double down on yourself or double down on if I can just try a little harder. And as David already said, he's like, God, I'm not that guy. Okay, I'm not that guy. I don't have the ability to do this on my own. I'm actually confessing my sinfulness. I'm actually confessing that this enemy, this this challenge is bigger than me right now. Therefore, you're the solution or I don't have one. If you're not willing to get there, you're not going to heal until you say, God, there is an issue in my life. I need help with it. And David is there. David is admitting that to the Lord. Read with me verse five and six. David says, I remember the days of old and I meditate on all of your works. I muse on the works of your hands and I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you. I love these, these three lines here in verse five. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all of your works and I muse on the work of your hands. David's solution to the problem is not more of him. It's not more steps. It's saying, I'm gonna fixate on God. I'm gonna meditate on what he's done for me. I'm gonna remember what he's done in the past and let it give me hope for what he might do in the future. I had a college professor at Liberty University. I I went into his office and we're talking or going over some paper or something. I don't remember quite uh, what it was, but we're in there and uh, I look over on a shelf and he's got these beautiful books and diplomas. And then he had these rocks and on the rocks, he had written different words. And I'm like, what has he got pet rocks? I don't understand. He's like a 60 year old dude. That's kind of weird. And, and on the rocks, I'm, I'm like trying to listen. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And I'm like drifting over here, reading the rocks names. And one of the rocks is named student debt. 
Uh, one of the rocks is named uh, depression. And then the third rock was named cancer. And I'm like, what are you doing of all the things to name your rocks after? So I, I interrupt them. I'm like, Dr. Smith, I gotta stop you here. I, what is with the rocks here? Why do you have three pet rocks and why did you name one cancer? And he laughs and he's like, well, you know, I, I teach a couple classes and I teach Old Testament. One of my favorite stories is Joshua chapter three, where the Israelites are coming into the promised land and, and God parts the Jordan River. And before he has the Jordan River flow back over, he tells the Israelites, hey, lay 12 stones at the bottom of the river. And I, I thought it was weird. Dr. Smith said, I thought it was weird that why would he put him at the bottom of the river? Because then the water just starts to flow and then, you know, no one can even see the monument. And he's like, but then I remembered and I saw or someone told me that, that in times of drought, that monument would be shown. And it was a reminder to the people of Israel. And God said, put this as a reminder to Israel of what I've done in the past for you, that I brought you into this land, that I brought you out of slavery, that I will be with you. And it only appeared in times of famine. It only appeared in times of drought when things were bad. And I just thought that was so powerful hearing him look back on his life. And he went on to tell me, hey, these rocks remind me when I'm having a bad day or I feel like, man, I don't see a way out of this. I look and I'm like, hey, God got me out of my student debt. God got me out of my depression. God got me out of the cancer that my wife had. And that was powerful to me. And he had this perspective to say, I I'm going to look back, not to observe my mistakes or problems, though they're great, but I'm going to look back to see what God has done in the past to give me hope for the future. And David is saying, I meditate on God and what he has done in the past, and, I and I'm encouraged by that. I'm lifted up by all that he's done. I look to the Bible and see what he has done, and I have hope for the future. And he continues on, he says, I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs to you as though I'm thirsty. And I, I, I like this as well. Um, when a need becomes very apparent to you, other things kind of just get blocked out. When you get fixated on, I really need something, everything else kind of just drifts off and you're just fixated on that need. Uh, if you go swimming and someone were to hold you underwater, and you're starting to drown or not have enough water, you're not going to be under there thinking, I wonder if I consolidate my student loans if I can buy a Tesla. You're going to be thinking, um, I need to breathe. I am suffocating. I need air. And every thought that you have will be fixated around, how can I breathe? What do I need to do to get air? I need to breathe. And the reality is you've needed to breathe all day. Just in that moment, you recognized your desperate need to breathe. You saw that in that moment. And David becomes painfully aware because he recognizes his need for God, there develops a, a desperation to go to him, to speak to him, to get into his word, to meditate and pray and spend time with God because he realizes if I don't have God, I'm done for. So I'm going to get on no matter what. I'm going to cast out anything that blocks my vision. I'm going to cast out anything that distracts me and I'm going to run to him because I need him. If I don't get him, I don't have a chance. There is this recognition of his dependency on God, but then, then we start to see a shift. Read with me verse 7. Answer me speedily, O Lord, for my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Listen to this, verse 8. I love, I love verse 8. I've been saying I like a lot of this, so deal with me. Uh, but verse 8, it says, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift my soul up to you. I love this passage because David is saying, God, every morning, every morning when I wake up, I want to remember what you're like. I want to remind myself of your love and kindness every day. That's my way forward is to know you better, to focus on you better. I don't know if uh, when you wake up in the morning, if you have like a song that wakes you up. Um, I did this for a long time, but the problem was I'd pick one of my favorite songs and then it made me hate that song because it's waking me up in the morning. And so I'd have this like, oh man, I got this like perfect song. And then after like a month, I'm like, that is 
oh, that's the worst song in the world. But I found one that I really do like. It's a very slow, gradual build, and it, and it wakes me up, and it's uh, In the Morning When I Rise. It's a really cool version of it, and it's slow, but it's literally this reminder as I'm waking up, hey, in the morning when you're getting up, give me Jesus. That's it. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And, and I love for that to be the song because even if I'm frustrated with the song because I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I don't want to wake up, I think to myself, but, but I'm rising. Then I should be thankful for that. And I'm rising and I have a job to go to and I should be thankful for that. Or I'm rising and yeah, my kid is giggling at my front door, you know, trying to wake me up, but I have a wonderful kid. That's a blessing. And so I'm, I'm trying to, to fixate on the Lord in the morning, and then it gives perspective to the rest of my day. It gives encouragement and hope for the rest of what I have to do. David is saying, God, in the morning when I rise, help me to fixate on your love for me. Not fixate on my problems, not fixate on my sin, not fixate on my mistakes, not fixate on anything but, but you. And then everything else kind of just falls into place. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but it falls into place. Again, I, I can't stress this enough. Following the Lord does not make your life easy. It does not make it, I don't know, more comfortable even. It makes it more uncomfortable, but, but it makes it good. It makes it worthwhile. And it makes it purposeful. It makes it meaningful. And David is not saying, God, I don't want these problems. He's saying, God, I, I want you to give me a perspective in the middle of these problems. I want you to be a grounding for me in the midst of these problems. And then I like this other part of verse 8 when he says, Cause me to know the way that I should walk, for I lift my soul up to you. He's saying, God, not only do I want me to, you to remind me of who you are every morning, but I also want you to lay out my steps for me that I might walk towards you. Lay out for me the steps that I might walk, that I might walk towards you. I love talking to young adults at this age because you, you guys have so much going on. Man, you're, you're taking different majors, different classes, you're in different jobs, it feels like you're moving places where you live. Uh, so much is in transit, and you might be like, yeah, that's the worst, but, it, and I, I get that, it's a challenging season. And when I talk to young people often, they'll be saying to me, Bear, I don't know what God wants me to do. I have these several colleges, and I don't know which one to pick. Or I like this girl, but I don't know if it's like the one, and I don't know what to do next, and I don't know what that next step is. What do I do? I was at a position where I was struggling with this. Um, I called just a couple of months ago uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, he was older than me, wiser, and I called him up and I'm like, hey man, I, I really want a step-by-step -step process on how to handle this relationship issue that I have. Uh, it's not with my wife, it was someone else. I'm like, I, I just have this issue with this person I, and I'm really struggling. I need you to tell me like a 20 step progression. What do I do? I need it laid out in detail. And I hated his answer. I hated it. He's like, I'm not going to give you that. I'm not going to give it to you. Because it's not clear. The Bible, for the situation you're describing, does not have a step-by-step -step progression. There is no chapter on how to pick a college class that you're supposed to take. There is no chapter on which of these, you know, two girls that you're interested in should you date. Like, that's not in the Bible specifically. And I think there's an intentionality with that. It's exhausting when we read through a long list exactly of what we're supposed to do or not do. And personally, my personality is such where I'm like, God, I literally wish you gave me a copy sheet every day of what you wanted me to do. From what you want me to drink in the morning to how you wanted me to go to sleep at night or what time. Like, I, just give me an itinerary, God. I would love that. And God doesn't do that. And my friend said, Barrett, the reason God doesn't always tell you directly what he wants you to do is because he wants you to get a little closer. He wants you to just walk towards him and in the direction of him and trust him even when you don't understand him. Trust him when every step isn't known directly in front of you. Let me answer it this way. If you don't know, you're like, man, I don't know what my career should be. I don't know what my, my thing should be in the future. Let me, let me help you out. Um, a great thing to do if you don't know what that career is, is to love God and love people. It's to wake in the morning and focus on the goodness of God and your salvation. 
is to meditate on his goodness and his faithfulness and draw near to him. And I know what you're thinking, because this is what I thought when my friend said this to me. I'm like, that is such a pastor answer. Like, of course, you're going to tell me to read more. Of course, you're going to tell me to get closer to God. Of course, you're going to tell me to pray. Like, that's such a, a Jesus juke answer, it feels like. But, but the reality is, it's what God calls us to. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew when he speaks to his disciples. In chapter 16, he says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. He did not specifically say, Peter, you need to do this and that, and then this decision you need to make sure you have this fork in the road. He didn't lay everything out. He just said, hey, follow me. Pick your cross up. Know that this will be hard. Know that this will be a dying and laying down of self. But follow me. Just like David said, God, I lift my soul up to you. I acknowledge myself in my right standing. I am sinful. I am not deserving of your forgiveness. And yet you offer it freely because you love me. And the greater I know your attributes and your nature, the greater I will be calm in situations that are not calm. See, church, we're not supposed to be led by our emotions. Our emotions cannot jerk us around depending on what's going on in our life because that is exhausting. I, oh, man, I'm going to get a little off topic here. But I, I do not like when people say, you know, all I ever want for them is I just want them to be happy. Like I look at my kids and like the best thing I want for their life is them just to be happy. I'm like, do you know what happiness is? Happiness is a fleeting moment, okay? Happiness cannot continually exist in your life because life is not always easy. Like, Life is challenging, it is depressing at times, it is exhausting, there is death and pain and suffering in it. Now, is there good? Yes. Is there wonderful things in life? Yes. Is there beauty? Is there rest? Is there encouragement? Of course, but, but don't delude yourself of thinking, my highest calling is just to pursue what makes me happy. No, it's not. God has more for you than just that. He has for you contentment. He has for you a peace. He has for you a joy that is deeper than just the emotion that is flared up in your life. Because if your life consists of how you're feeling that day, your life will be wildly up and down. Your day, if people ask you, hey, how's your day going? That might alter from hour to hour. You might say in the morning, it's been wonderful. By afternoon, you're saying it's miserable. By the evening, you're saying it was all right. Because if you're jerked around by your mood and what's going on, you're going to be exhausted. But, but if in the morning when you rise, you fixate on God and you allow His steadiness, His love, His, His consistency with you, His track record in the past, if you allow those things to be an anchor, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right because you recognize you need Him. Don't just ask for God to fix your problems. Ask for God to, to fill you up and encourage you and draw near to Him. And I like this phrase, it's easier to hear God's voice when you're closer to Him. It's easier to hear God's voice when you're closer to Him. I always thought it was funny when I was a kid, my mom would be yelling and I couldn't fully hear her and I would just yell back as loud as I could, what? You know, like rather, like, and like four or five times she's yelling back and forth, whatever. I'm just like, what do you want? Like, what if I just simply, I don't know, go upstairs, like, you know, go to where she is, and then she doesn't have to scream. And I feel like sometimes God is shouting to us, like, hey, I'm trying to get your attention. And we're like, what? What do you want? And he's like, I want you to get closer. But God, like, what career do you want from me? What, what person do you want me to marry? No, no, no. No, just pause. I just want you to get closer to me. And those things will be made known to you. Maybe not in a moment, but... But maybe they'll be known to you in the stillness, known to you in a peace that I give to you. Draw near to me, and I'll lead you in this life. And no, you won't have all the answers, but, but that will actually increase your faith in me. It will increase your trust in me and your dependency on me. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. Draw near to the Lord. As David said, Lord, I meditate on you. I fixate on you.
Every morning when I rise, I just want to fixate on your nature towards me. Don't fixate just on the problems of your life. Now, there are things that you and I can do. I'm not telling you to throw your hands up and be like, well, Lord, my room is messy and uh, I just throw my hands up to you. What can I do? Well, go to the Lord, pray, maybe read the Proverbs where it says, hey, uh, don't be a sluggard. And then clean your room, you know? Like th there are actually actionable things you can control. I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm not saying, like, be like, Lord, please give me a wife. You know, if you're a guy, please give me a wife. And, and then, you know, God's like, well, yeah, go talk to girls, okay? Like, you know, there's, there's like a, you know, give and take in this relationship here. But, but in all of those steps, take the Lord with you and allow him to direct you. It'll be good. So I challenge you and I challenge myself. Draw near to the Lord. And as you do, your steps will become much more aware to you. Let's pray. Father God, life is ups and downs. All of us could sit down and list out challenging times in our life. Or perhaps we'll have them in the future. We could talk about times where our soul feels crushed, where we feel trapped in darkness, where there is a temptation or addiction that we struggle with, where there is a relationship that we don't see a way forward with. And God, we just ask for your clarity. And your clarity comes when we get closer to you. I pray we would recognize our need for you, daily need for you, Lord that we'd seek you in the morning, that we would meditate on your, on your word and meditate on what you've done in the past and have hope for the future, even when we don't see that future. When things get foggy in our vision, Lord, might we slow down and just wait for it to clear and be with you in that fogginess or in that confusion. Help us not to be led by our emotion, but help us to be led by your spirit, God. We love you. And it's the name of your son Jesus that we pray all these things. And everybody said, Amen.